chapter 4, beginning at verse 10, and uh, I'll read to verse 13, though we're going to conclude our study t- today with uh, verse 10 to the conclusion, uh, verse 23. But let's read verses 10 through 13 and get into our study. Paul writes, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, as we begin, I want you to see verse 10. I'll just give you a few little basic things and we'll move into our study. But notice with me in verse 10 how Paul uses the word rejoice. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. So again, he uses the word rejoice. Remember when we began our study in Philippians, I I pointed out that rejoicing is a main theme in this particular letter. And he's rejoicing. He's thanking God, rejoicing for the kindness that the Philippians have shown towards him. He's grateful to God because it's God who gave them the opportunity as well as the ability to give. And it's God who directed their hearts to once again support him and care for his needs. He's thanking God because the church financially is supporting his ministry. That's why he says in verse 10, now at last your care for me has flourished again. You see, at one time they had supported him. They had a previous history of caring for his needs, but over time had slacked off. At one time they had faithfully, financially cared for him, but now they hadn't been, and now they're renewing their support. It it had been around 10 years uh, since Paul had planted this church in Philippi. And it's interesting, when you look at the history of the Philippian church, how it actually began, it's interesting because the church at Philippi actually grew out of a woman's prayer meeting. That's how it began. It was really a woman's prayer group that that met. It's recorded in the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 11 through 15. There was a businesswoman by the name of Lydia, and she had heard Paul's message And when she heard the message of the gospel, Lydia got saved. And and so she and her entire household had become baptized. And she even constrained Paul. She really prevailed upon him to, uh, to live in her home. It's interesting when you look in scripture, it's interesting how often women will see the value of of being saved. Women see the value of investing their life in the kingdom of God. We, we see the widow of Zarephath who gave her last bit of flour and oil to feed Elijah. And, and when she did so, when Elijah was speaking to her, it's found in, in 1 Kings chapter 17, when Elijah was speaking to her and said to her to uh, give him something to eat. And she said to him, listen, I was about to make something for my son. It's the last bit that we have. And, and after I was to serve him, uh, we were just basically preparing to die. Well, We see there that the prophet says, go ahead and make it. Make me something to eat. And as a result of that, God began to bless. It says in 1 Kings 17, 16, the bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. And so this widow is somebody that that trusted and and did even as she was told, and and God blessed. We see that Jesus was supported by a group of faith-filled women. You see that in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3 where it says there that certain women and many others provided for Jesus from their abundance. And so we, uh, we see that happening. Obviously, one of the most key um, individuals we see in Scripture is the, the widow with her mites and how that she gave of all that she had to live on uh, to the Lord. Very often when we look at that particular story of the widow's mites, uh, we, we look and emphasize the, the small amount that she gave. And, and I think that sometimes we are actually giving people permission to to not be generous with the Lord. And we're missing the point of the story. It wasn't simply that she gave something that was inconsequential. It really added up to very little uh, in terms of how much she gave. But the fact is that Jesus is emphasizing the fact that she gave all that she had as an offering to the Lord. Very often we say, well, that means that I can tip God. And sometimes we give our waitresses more than we actually give to the Lord. 
And that's not how the Lord is. He's basically saying, I'm watching how these people give, and they're casting their, their, their funds into this trumpet, and it makes a lot of noise. This woman's coming with two coins that make very little noise because they're so insignificant. But the Lord commends because that's what she had to live on that day, and she gave everything to the Lord, and that's how the Lord uh, regarded her. And he said, this will always be spoken of because of her great love and faith in God. And so you see that at the beginning, the Lord was doing a work. He did a work there through a woman named Lydia. Paul had been there ministering. She gave her heart to the Lord. She cared for him, and from the beginning of the existence of the church there in Philippi, Paul had been supported. But it's interesting how he uses the word, verse 10 again, flourished. He says, at last your care for me has flourished again. He chooses to use a word uh, that really relates to agriculture. It, it speaks of the fact that fruit trees will enter into times of barrenness. Uh, even as a tree goes through seasons, I have fruit trees in my backyard that no matter how I try to kill them, they just remain. And, uh, and I have noticed that they go through seasons of barrenness. They have their winter and, and, and fall and all of that. But when spring comes, how they once again blossom. And that's the term that he's using. The word flourish speaks of once again they're budding and producing fruit. And so you have become barren for a season, but once again you're beginning to bud and produce fruit. And so he's rejoicing that once again they're supporting the ministry. So he says, even as he's doing that, uh, your care for me has flourished again. But he wants to go on. He doesn't want him to feel bad. So he says, though you surely did care, you lacked opportunity. It's not that he wants them to be giving through guilt or compulsion. That's, that's not how the Lord is. I mean, Paul makes it very clear when he writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians that, that God doesn't like grumpy givers. It's not that you give with, with a complaining spirit, oh, I have to give again at all. God likes the cheerful giver, and, and that's what blesses the Lord's heart. I've told you this story a thousand times. I'll repeat it about the little boy who was given the dollar and the quarter and was told you give the dollar to the Lord in your offering today in Sunday school, and the quarter's yours. And, and so the little boy goes, and Mama's doing his pants later on. She's washing, and she puts her hand in his pocket and finds the dollar bill, and she calls her son, and she says, listen, honey, I told you to give the Lord a dollar, and you could keep the quarter, but it's obvious you gave a quarter, and you kept the dollar. Why'd you do that? And the little boy looking at his mother says, well, because the Lord loves a cheerful giver, and I'm more cheerful giving a quarter than a dollar, <laughs> you know, and, and that's how people are very often, and so he's saying, I rejoice. I rejoice that you're giving, but I don't want to make you feel bad. I don't want you to give out of compulsion. You know, because sometimes people, you know, if that bucket comes in front, you ought to see them. They want to faint. You know, I find it interesting in church when I'm sitting there next to somebody during the offering. They must feel, they must feel like, oh, I better give. Pastor's looking at me. Just because I'm standing holding the bucket, that doesn't mean, you know. Some people feel forced to give. The Lord doesn't want us to feel forced to give and, and so Paul is making it very clear listen you had a desire but you didn't have opportunity they had been going through financial stress and this particular church is in a region called Macedonia which is if you're looking at a map Greece originally was divided into two sections you had southern section where Corinth was and then you had Macedonia which is a northern portion there and um, Macedonia is uh, the region that this particular church was. And so they had, in that region, gone through some very tough times. They had persecution. They had suffered reproaches. They had a loss of property. There was severe affliction. When Paul was writing in 2 Corinthians, if you take notes, it's found in chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. He said this, he said, Brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction... The abundance of their joy and their deep poverty. When he speaks of their deep poverty, that speaks of scraping the bottom. They were so broke. Their deep poverty abounded, he says, in the riches of their liberality or their generosity. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, he said, they were freely willing. Even though they were scraping the bottom of the barrel. When they knew there was a need in the body of Christ, they had a heart that was willing to be touched 
because they understood the value of generosity and caring for others and giving their offerings to the Lord. And that's what he's speaking about. It may be that they hadn't supported him for some simple reasons. Maybe they, maybe they just didn't know where he was. It may be that they were simply unaware of his needs, but he rejoices because once again, he says, your care has flourished towards me. Now, when we get to verse 18, which we'll do in about two hours, when you get to verse 18, it speaks of Epaphroditus there, and we'll see that in a moment. But he says of Epaphroditus that he had arrived and had brought financial support from the Philippians. And so he's rejoicing. Now, why does he rejoice? Was it because, once again, his physical needs are being taken care of? Was it because Paul was so concerned about his material needs that uh, he just rejoices over that because they were that important? No, he, he rejoices because in their support, and this is an important point, in their support, there is a recognition that his ministry is from God. In that support, they're actually saying, you are a genuine minister. You are a true minister. Because a true minister is supported. You see, a true minister to the church, well, the church has the duty and responsibility to care for his needs. And so their support for him was a loving demonstration of their trust that he indeed was the real thing. There are some who wonder why, why uh, ministers get full uh, financial compensation. And one of the simplest reasons is because God commands it. God commands it. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 6, let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. 1 Corinthians 9, 14, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. The scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. And so he was compensated because he's the real thing. And so while in prison, he still has physical needs, so their support causes him to rejoice. It's an evidence of their love for him, their support for him, and their trust that he's the genuine thing, the real thing. And so, like it says in 1 John 3, 18, my, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. They're demonstrating their love by giving and supporting the needs that he has. Remember, I've been sharing with you that he was in prison. He was more than likely in a prison that is called the Mamertine prison. I have mentioned to you that I've been in that prison area in Rome, and it was a... Uh, it was a prison cell that was carved out of rock. And uh, at the ceiling, there's an opening. And we've been in the prison cells. And you can see the opening where they would um, lower the guards in and out. There were no windows. They only had lanterns, oil lanterns, very often, for any light at all. And the prisoner was chained to a wall. And because they didn't have any sewage, they didn't have any latrine, the prisoner would be left there in his own, uh, his own waste and, uh, unless somebody would come in and care for him. And he had nothing really of his own unless somebody were, were to send some things to him, perhaps some, some clothing or something to make him more comfortable or perhaps send him some money so he could use the money to give money to a guard or somebody else to go out and buy some things for him. And uh, that's how it was. It, the system was a horrible system in many ways. And that's how Paul was. He didn't have any source of income. So people had to support him. And therefore, he's grateful because he continues to have needs even though he's in prison. And so he rejoices in that because they once again are caring. They're demonstrating their love. Now, he says in verse 11, not that I speak in regard to need. I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to, to be abased, and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. I've learned through experience. I have learned, he says, and I know. You see, 
My joy, he's saying, is not centered on purely physical things. I'm content in the Lord. He's saying, I have a joy that comes that is beyond my circumstances. I've shared this with you before, but we speak about happiness, and, and the word happiness is really something that is derived by my circumstances. The word happiness is actually the word happenings. And the way that that's found is happiness is in my happenings, what's around me, what's happening in my life. Well, it makes me, I'm, I'm happy because of those things. Joy is deeper than that. Joy is deeper. Joy is something that comes in a spiritual sense from the Spirit of God. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It's that knowledge that God's in control, even though my circumstances around dictate that I ought to be depressed. My circumstances surround me right now uh, are, are of such nature that I, I probably should be just the most sorrowful person because in many ways sometimes, well, bottom line, the psalmist in Psalm 23 spoke the truth to all of us when he says, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And many of us do that. We understand what it's like to go through the good times and the bad times. And a lot of times it seems that we're in the valley more than we are on the hilltop. And there we are, it's walking through the valley. Why do you think this is called Chino Valley? <laughs> Should have called it Chino Hills, you know. Because <laughs> they're on the hills, man, I'm in the valley. But you do, you walk through the valley. You walk through the valley, he says, of the shadow of death, but I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. That's what you learn. And you learn those lessons by going through deep things. Do you want to be deep with God? Do you want to be deep with God? You're going to go through deep things. You ever ask the Lord in, in the way you pray, God, I want to be on fire for you? You ever ask God that? I have. God, I want to be on fire. Fire burns and fire consumes. And when you ask the Lord to make you an on-fire vessel for him, God, I want to have your heart. Well, wait a minute. Maybe we ought to read Isaiah 53 again and look at the wounded healer there. A man who was acquainted with grief. A man who understood what it was to be rejected. That's who Jesus Christ is. And what's the Bible say is happening in my life? The Bible says I am being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And so what was Jesus? He was broken. He was rejected. He was bruised and he was battered. And yet he was never alone. And in that, I understand some things about Christianity. You see, when I constantly would say, you know, I just want to be blessed. Well, there are also batterings and there are also buffetings that take place. Because that's what creates in you the likeness of Christ. That's how it works. And so Paul is saying here something that most people don't want to hear. I know how to be abased. And I know how to abound. I know how to be hungry. And I know how to be full. I've been both. And therefore, I understand what it means to have the hand of God on my life. I've learned these things. And I know these things. He uses the word learned, and he uses the word know. I've increased my knowledge through practice, and now I own that experience. I've gone through life's general experiences. I've learned some things. But through the work of the Holy Spirit, I've come to understand the way of contentment. That's why in verse 12 he says, Everywhere and in all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry. I've learned the deep secrets of how God gives contentment. I've been abased, which means I've been humbled. And I know how to abound. That means to excel. It can be spoken of as being honored by men. And though I've been humbled, and through being humbled, I can now receive man's commendation and not become proud because of that. It's been said the most beautiful sound in a person's ears is the sound of his own name being pronounced by somebody else. We like to hear people speak of us, especially when they speak well of us. Paul is saying, listen, through my buffetings and through my abasements, I've learned to receive the commendation of man and see it for what it is. The same person who today tells you, I love you with all my heart, can be the person who just the next day is saying, I never liked you and I've hated you for the longest time. It's the truth. And in ministry, I can tell you, that's very true. You know, I have, I have had people say, oh, Pastor, you know, you speak the words of life to me. And the next time, they're saying, I hate your guts. 
And, and that's Marie. I mean, think of what the rest of the church did. The rest of the church wounds me deeply. But I've learned, he, he says, I've learned to, to see God move in super wonderful ways. I've also learned the secrets of contentment through the times that I've had really nothing except for him. He said, I've been hungry. I've been full. I've been in abundance. I've had need. I've had the, the hunger and the poverty. I've also had so many good things. And through all these things, I have learned to be content. How did you learn that? Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's how I learned that. The source of strength and the source of contentment is Jesus Christ. Is doing all things through him. Spiritual strength is derived from Jesus living in us because it is Jesus who supplies the spirit to us. And when you're in Christ and he is giving to you of his spirit, you can do all things. Jesus in John 15, 5 said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Without him, you can do nothing. But with him, you can do all things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can go through whatever it is I have to go through because he provides me strength. I can walk through that valley, that shadow. I can walk through it because he never leaves me, nor does he ever forsake me. I can go through the times that I go through and hold fast, not because I have some incredible will or optimistic spirit, but because I'm never alone. Because you never are alone. You never are alone. He is always with you. He has said that. I will never, never, never leave you nor forsake you. That's why we're content in him. That's why. That's the secret. Jesus is with you. When you're in that hospital room and you're, you're speaking to that one who's, who is passing from this life into the next and you're realizing all they mattered to you, all they meant to you, all they are to you, and as you're looking at them, there's just something inside of you that's saying, this isn't the end. You'll see them again. I was sharing with a, a friend of mine just yesterday how that when my, my father-in-law, Marie's daddy, when, when, he, when he died, I was in the room. I was in the room with him when he passed and uh, along with others. And I remember as I was at the foot of the bed there and, and he was in a coma and I'm watching the monitor and I was standing at the foot of the bed, and there were others with me, his sons and, and all. As I was standing there, I looked at my father-in-law, and, and I'd been in the family for a long time, for a long time. And as I was standing there looking at my father-in-law, and it was quiet, I remember I put my hand on his foot, and I held on to his foot for a moment. And I said to him this, I said, I want to tell you two things, Mr. Lopez. I never called my father-in-law by his first name. I was raised in an era where you call him sir or you call him by his last name. That's just the way I am. That's the way I was raised. So I never called him Reuben. I never felt the, the liberty to. He wouldn't have minded it. I just never felt comfortable doing that. It's Mr. Lopez. And I said, Mr. Lopez, I want to tell you two things. One. I want to thank you. I want to thank you. And two, I want to tell you this. I want to say something I never said to you. You never heard me say this until now. I said, I want you to know I love you. And the second thing, I want to thank you for the, ra the way you raised your daughter. I want to thank you for the way you raised Marie. And as I was speaking to him, in that final time of my conversation with my father-in-law, whether he heard me or not, I'll never know. 
I had one thing, the family had one thing, and that was this. We knew that this wasn't goodbye forever because when my father-in-law suffered the stroke that eventually was his ticket home, my son Joseph went and knelt down beside his, his grandfather. And my son Joseph joined in the labors of the other kids who had had the opportunity to lead him to Christ. And so when he had had his stroke, Joseph knelt next to him and said to him, Grandpa, are you ready? And my father-in-law said, Joseph, I'm a good man. And Joseph said to his, his grandfather, you are a good man, but you're not good enough. You need Jesus Christ, Grandpa. And he prayed with him and brought him into the family of God. And so you go through valleys. You go through pain. You go through the sense of loss. I was driving with Marie after my father-in-law went home to be with the Lord. And my dad had gone home to be with Jesus two years before my father-in-law, almost to the day. My dad died February 13th. My father-in-law died February 15th. My father-in-law died in the same hospital room my dad died in two years before. When I was standing talking to my father-in-law, I was looking at the bed my father died in. And as I was going through that, and I remember, forgive me, the emotions come up. I shouldn't allow them to. I should be like raw tough, but I'm not. <laughs> As I was looking there, remembering those things, the Lord was given to me and all of us his peace that passes all understanding. We all go through tough times. We all do. None of us is exempt from this. All of us do. It depends on what is in you. And what's in me is the Spirit of God. And that's why Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When my dad was dying, he said to me, I'm going to have Marco do my funeral service. And I said to my dad, no, you're not. And he looks at me, he says, you can do it. And I looked at my dad. And I said, Daddy, I brought you into the kingdom. I'm going to send you home to be with Jesus. Yes, I can do your funeral. And some of you perhaps were with me when I did that funeral almost 10 years ago now. And I gave a funeral for my father. How do you do that without the strength of the Lord? How do you do? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can go through the tough times, and so can you. The disappointing times when you have a child who's made a poor choice. When you're going through a tough time in a job or having a difficult time with a neighbor. When you're going through the pain that you can go through. I'm not sure what I'm going to do to make this house payment or to make that payment on that car. When you're going through those moments, that's what I have learned. And that's what Paul is saying. He's saying, I've learned to abound. I have learned to be abased. I have learned to be full. And man, I have times when I have been so hungry and I can do all things through Christ because he is the one who strengthens me. Nevertheless, verse 14, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only for even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I'm full, having received from Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, while pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Again, he doesn't want them to think that their gift and their concern is not appreciated. You have done well, he says in verse 14, in that you shared in my distress. Your generous support has made my difficult circumstances easier to bear. But he goes on and he says, uh, you Philippians in verse 15 also know that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed, in other words, when the gospel was first preached in your area, you had supported me. Uh, when I had gone to Athens, when I went to Corinth, 
No other church had helped defray the expenses. The only one that did was, was you, the church at Philippi. He said, no church, in verse 15, shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Now, it's interesting, and if, unless you look at it closely, you might not even notice this. It's interesting how he uses a business or commercial phrase here, a giving and receiving. Giving and receiving are words used when doing the financial books for a business. One column is used for disbursement. The other is a, record, a record of receiving goods. And Paul is simply saying that you received spiritual care and you gave material support. There's a fair exchange for those who care about spiritual things. It's interesting if you take notes, 1 Corinthians 9, 11, how, how Paul said there, if we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? Well, it depends on your spiritual maturity and your spiritual viewpoint. For some people, they would think, oh, you ought not to give that person that ministry any support at all. What, why should I? And other people say, because that ministers to my soul, because that ministers in my life. You know, a lot of people who, who see Christians who give as fools, they see you as fools. You're, you're trusting those people with your finances. You could take that money and use it for so many other things. Well, the reason they say that is because they have no concern for their own spiritual estate. And somebody who ministers the word of God, well, to them it matters not. They're charlatans. I've had more than one person who has accused me of being a fake and all, just trying to make it on, on, on the generosity of others. That's the way people think. They think that we're manipulators and users. But somebody who understands spiritual things, like Paul said, if I've sown spiritual things in your life, then, then what's wrong with my receiving enough to, to eat and clothe myself with. What's wrong with that? Other people do that all the time. It's interesting how people sometimes will complain, say the church, all the church ever does is ask for money. All the church ever does is ask for money. And then they leave to a restaurant. I'm sure that they charged them for that food. They climb into a car and they, they didn't get that for free. Somebody charged them to buy that car. I mean, everything they're wearing, somebody charged them for. And for them, that was cool. It's all right. I don't mind. But when it comes to spiritual things, for them, they say, oh, no, no, that ought to be completely free. Everything else um, I'll pay for, but fill my soul with, with spiritual things. Paul says, no, wait a minute. You know, the one who sows is also one who eats. And he ought to be cared for. And Paul is saying, I'm grateful that you have cared for me. But I want you to see his point, and it's a powerful one in verse 17. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. This is what I call heavenly investments. I don't want to appear to long for your support, he's saying, and I don't want to look like I'm greedy for your finances. Because, to be honest with you, Somebody who is longing for financial support and finances from people, well, really, that's genuine, uh, generally the mark of a false teacher. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3, it says, By covetousness they exploit you with deceptive words. So he's saying, my heart's pure. And the reason my, my heart is pure is because I have a genuine concern for your spiritual life. I'm not using you, Paul was saying, uh, for my own financial profit. I'm not using you for my own personal gain. When he was speaking to the Thessalonians, he said in 1 Thessalonians 2, 5, neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. God is witness. I'm not trying to make a lot of money off of you. He's saying your offerings actually enrich the giver spiritually and is entered on your account to your credit. Every act of Christian ministry enriches the one who performs it. Never forget that. Proverbs 11.25 says, The generous soul will be made rich. He who waters will also be watered himself. You can never outgive God. You can't. He owns it all anyway. You can never outgive God. Now, there are people, I have to be honest with you, who think otherwise. There was a guy who, this is a true story, by the way. There was a guy who heard that if you give to God, God will bless you. So for a year, he kept, uh, he went to a church and he gave offerings for a year and then he kept an account of how much he made that year and then sued the church for breach of promise. 
because he said, you said I'd be blessed and I wasn't. And he actually sued the church in a court of law because he said, you made a promise that was not fulfilled. And, and that's kind of how some people think. You know, the, when you give to the Lord, you, you, your, your, your left hand doesn't even know what your right hand is doing. It's, it's one of those things where you simply give out of the love that you have for God. And, and yet God has said, I'll care for you. And it goes into your account. In, in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8, it says, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. God is able to bless you. So in their giving of their gifts and support for Paul, there's a fruit that's abounding to them. They're actually laboring alongside of Paul through their finances, and that's true in all ministries. Your gifts make the presentation of the message possible. And this church here, we're meeting in this room here, we're able to do that because people support the ministry. That's just the way it works. It makes sense to me. There are bills to be paid. And, and the reason we're able to be in here right now or in our sanctuary on Sunday mornings, whenever, is because people understand that. And they give, they support, and it goes to their account. Indeed, notice what he says in verse 18. I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, a sweet smell and aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. But he goes on to say, and my God, shall supply all your need. Now notice he didn't say, my God shall supply all your greed. That's different. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. My God will supply. My God will supply. Marie was at the uh, kitchen table many years ago. Our church had just begun. And I had, I had started this, this work, and we didn't have any finances. And so I was looking for work, and I was, I believe at that time, I was working for a member of the church who had a, um, a gardening kind of uh, business. And, uh, and I was learning how to do, you know, sprinklers and things of that nature, and that's what I was doing. And uh, to be honest with you, um, times were real tough financially. Uh, when the church began, I didn't receive a salary. I, what I did is I, I said, listen, because somebody had said, David, you didn't receive an offering on our first Sunday morning. What if we want to give to the Lord? I said, listen, um, we're not even incorporated. You don't have tax-deductible gifts. Uh, but what if we want to give to support you? That I'm not doing this so you can support me, but what if we want to? I said, well, you see that macrame and you see that pot hanging there? Put your gifts in that. Anything you mark for David's family, we'll use for my family. And anything that is not marked in that way, we're gonna use for church and corporation. And so we received for our supply, uh, for our support, $100. And the rest went towards incorporation. And that was pretty much the average every week, $100 a week. I had um, $1,500 or so a month that I had to pay in bills and things at that time. So you can see the difference, just do the math. We didn't have any finances. And so at the same time, I was looking at some end of the year kinds of things and I noticed that, I had noticed that, that our gifts were not at the percentage I really believe that we should be giving in order to, to honor God with our giving. And so, Marie was sitting at the table and we had a nice talk about how we need to be trusting God. God will supply our need. We, we need to make sure he is, he is honored in our giving. And um, this one day she was at the table and she was crying because we didn't have the money to pay the bills when we received a gift in the mail. 
And I was there at the table telling her, all I know is this, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. That's all I know. I'm looking for work. I'm trying to supply for this family. I'm doing the best that I can do. My God shall supply. I remember telling my wife that. You need to remember, I was 31 years old at that time. I was a young man. And so the mailman came, and I went to go get our bills, because I expected bills in the mail. And I came back, and we began to open things, and someone had given us a gift. And I opened it up, and I put it in front of my wife. And I said, my God shall supply my need. God will take care of us. We have to trust him. I learned that lesson a long time ago. My God shall supply my need. Not my greed, but my need. What is it that I need? He will take care of it. You know, the birds of the air are cared for by my heavenly Father. Jesus said, not one of them hits the ground without your Father knowing it. He knows the number of the hairs of your head. He said, if the grass that today is there and then it's reaped and it's thrown into an oven, if God's aware of those kinds of things, isn't he going to be aware of your needs too? Oh, you, little, you have little faith, he said. I've discovered something. I've discovered that, that my heart and my checkbook have a chain. And I can talk all day long about my faith and trust in the Lord. But when I sit down and I make a gift out to the Lord and I place it in that, in that, uh, that box or in that basket that passes by, that is one of the greatest evidences that I trust God, that I have. Because he's going to have to supply that meal for me. He's going to have to supply those things. But you come first. I can tell you this, without any trying to get you, if you don't want to give, don't give. If you do give, that's nice too. It's between you and the Lord. So I can say this honestly before you. The first check in our checkbook that is signed is our tithe. The first one. I give my gifts to the Lord first, and everything else comes after that. Because my God is able, and he has given me all things. And I trust him, and I've learned to do that over the years. That's what Paul is talking about. Your gifts are a pleasing sacrifice to God. And so he says, you need to understand that though you're giving to God, they result in a blessing to you. And I believe that that's what the Lord would have us to know. There's a sin that's called covetousness. And covetousness reveals a heart not set on heaven. Some look for material gain to provide contentment. But material things never are the source of contentment. The Bible in 1 Timothy 6, verse 6 says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. But adults will say, if I bought it, then I can keep it. It's mine, and I can use it any way that I please. Well, is that absolutely true? Is it mine? Did I buy it with my own resources? Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 17 and 18, the Lord says, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your forefathers as it is today. It's been said that covetousness is broken by generosity. And so when I learn to invest in the kingdom of God, God blesses. And then finally in verse 20 to 23, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. He began in the grace of God, and he concludes with the grace of God. Notice verse 23. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. There is fruit, even behind bars. God does not cease working. God can move. Because when he says, um, in verse 22, all the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household, Paul, and had ministry, even behind bars. Paul was still leading people to Christ. Paul was still being used by the Lord. Ultimately, Every one of us is going to have an opportunity to stand before the Lord. And I've been saying this recently, and I'll say it again as we're about to conclude. Um, there's one thing that is becoming more and more real to me. 
that I want you guys to, to maybe grab hold of too. And that is this. I know that I'm going to be standing before the Lord before too long. I believe in heaven. And I believe that there's really a God. I remember when, I was, when my father died and, and we were inside this room, this private viewing room, and there was the casket with my father's body in it. We call it seed that was ready to be planted. I remember when I was there and my, my family and my mom and my family were all in the room. I remember walking up to that casket and where the, my, my dad's body was. And I remember just standing while my brother and sisters and Marie and my mom were talking. And I remember walking in, looking into the face of my, my father who had gone home, gone home to be with the Lord. And I remember just standing there, looking there in the face of my father, knowing that, that soon I'd never see his outer form again until heaven. And as I was looking at him, and while everybody else was talking, I just had a private moment between the Lord and me. Some of you have gone through this. I stood there looking in the face of my dad. And a thought hit me, is there a heaven? Is there a heaven? Because if there isn't, you'll never see this man again. And I looked into the face of my father and that eternity, that question of eternity came up in my heart. Is there a heaven? Because if there isn't one, you will never see this man. And I walked away saying, I know there is a heaven. And I know that I'll see my dad again. And I know that it's going to be a time of joy and a great reunion and a tremendous blessing. But every one of us eventually stands in that place. Every one of us will one day stand in that place. And we need to understand that it's through the grace of God and the goodness of God that we have the ability to do all things all things for God. And then one day, we're going to be hearing his voice, and he's going to be saying to us, well done, my good and my faithful servant. Enter in to the joy of your Lord, and that's going to come because of the grace of God.